Welcome to the Hardcore MBA Podcast with your host, Erland Bakke. Would you like to have a free copy of the number one international best-selling book, Never Work Again? All you have to do is rate, review, and subscribe to Hardcore MBA Podcast on iTunes and email us a screenshot of your review to erland at mroutsource.com. Hello and welcome to Hardcore MBA. Signing in here from beautiful London town, just moved here from Oslo. And I am really excited today because we have some excellent, excellent people on the call here. We have David Benham, who is not here, and we have his brother, his twin brother, Jason Benham, uh, who is signing in from the US. Now, they have ventured into professional baseball. They have a multi-million dollar real estate empire that was going to be on H. GTV, uh, but it was actually cancelled, and they wrote about all that in their book, Whatever the Cost, which you can now get on Amazon. It was published in February 2015. Jason, welcome to the call. Thanks. Glad to be on. How did you guys decide to start a company together? Because, you know, if me and my brother were to start a company together, um, there would be a lot of challenging moments, I believe. <laughs> That's hilarious. Hey, well, you know, I should probably be asking you the question. You're the one that's the serial entrepreneur and, you know, global international powerhouse bestseller. So, uh, you know, I should probably just be interviewing you this time, Erland. Well, I think we could do a little bit of both. <laughs> I, I like that. Well, my brother and I, we, uh, we got done playing professional baseball in 2001. We moved our families to Charlotte, North Carolina, because we just absolutely were in love with uh, with the 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 climate and the culture of the of the Carolinas and that's where we wanted to raise our families but we had no clue what we were going to do we weren't bonus babies so we didn't sign for a million bucks to play baseball and uh, we were minor league guys and we always wanted to make it to the big leagues but we didn't make it so we got out of baseball and um, we literally moved to Charlotte and, and earned our real estate licenses together seriously I mean it was like I just said Hey, I'm going to real estate class. And Dave was like, okay, I'll go too. So <laughs> that's what we did. And um, during that time, we were just holding odd jobs, doing whatever. We were 20, let's see, we were 27 at the time, I think, 20, 26, 27 years old. And um, so after we earned our real estate licenses together, we, we had always um, owned businesses together when we were young. And one of the main ones was a landscape company. So you know, honestly, what we did, I had just earned my master's degree. We we're both former pro baseball players, and we had no clue what we were going to do to earn a living for our families because we had young families. We honestly started a, a landscape company again. <laughs> <laughs> so we did that, and we were mowing lawns for a little while, and we decided to start selling houses. And it just one thing led to another. And um, I can get into deeper detail later on if you'd like me to. But but in terms of being a twin and and having my brother and business together, you know, at the at the um, Dixie Stampede uh, several years ago, the the there was a horse pool competition and one of the the, the actual winning horse pulled nine thousand pounds um, in this in this horse pool. And the second horse pulled 7,000 pounds. So the two owners of these horses got together and they said, you know what, let's put these horses together and see if they can pull 17,000 pounds, or uh, let's see, 16,000 pounds. And uh, th they put the horses together, they hitched them up, and they ended up pulling 30,000 pounds. Wow. It proving that you can accomplish way more together with someone than you can individually. And, uh, and God made us together. He, he made us to be twins. And so we just decided, as opposed to splitting off, why don't we just go ahead and harness the very thing that God did, which was put us together. And, and that's the way it's been ever since. So and now we're 14, 13 years into building our businesses, and it's been a, it's been a good ride. So why do you think most people go out there alone and, and, and try to make it in business? I think part of the reason is um, identity. I think that uh, as people, we tend to define ourselves by what we do instead of who we are. And of course, my brother and I are born again Christians. We feel as though that God created people in his image and therefore he's put parts of himself into people. And if you don't 
come to peace with the the very one who's created you, then you're always going to constantly try to prove yourself to others, and uh, and and prove yourself to yourself to make your to make yourself feel like you have worth, and therefore we tend to define ourselves by what we do and not who we are as created by God, and so I think that there is that constant um, desire for independence. And, and I'm a twin, so I know what this feels like more than anybody because I grew up sharing a room with my brother. I grew up always being called by the wrong name. I grew up being known as one of the brothers, never being known as Jason or anything like that. But our dad just taught us that, you know, hey, guys, this is how God's made you. And, um, and, and you guys need to harness that. So there was never a desire for me to, like, make a name for my own self. It was always in the context of being with my brother. And we do have our own individual identities, don't get me wrong. But it's not based on what we do. It's based on who we are. And uh, although I had to learn that lesson in pro ball, I, I definitely found satisfaction in the fact that I was a professional baseball player. And when we'd go into a, a party or whatever and people would invite us and or invite me, and you know, the first question that always comes after we – find out someone's name when you first meet them is what, what do you do? That's what people want to know what you do. And based upon your answer to that question, you make a, you make a, a judgment call on who they are. And by and large, a lot of times that, that call may be wrong. So if you were to ask me, Erlen, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a short order chef at, at um, Waffle House. Well, you would make certain judgments about me, but if I were to tell you that I'm a serial entrepreneur and own 14 full profit, you know, fully functioning entities across the globe, well, you'd make another assumption. And um, and so we we have a tendency to define ourselves by what we do and not who we are. And we talk a lot about that in our book. When I was living in New York, I and people asked me what I what I did. Um, at the time, I had an office on Wall Street. So, um, like a co-working awesome. space, right? So people would ask me, "Oh, what, what do you do?" And I would say, oh, would you, "Do you want a long, the long version or the short version?" And the <laughs> short version was, "I work on Wall Street." And you know, oftentimes people would come back and say, "Like, yeah, he's in finance too." And I say, uh, I would be going, "No, I, I didn't. I never said that. I just said I work on Wall Street." You know. <laughs> that's good. I like it. that. Makes a good point. But I, but I think there's a lot of. Um, uh, fear and greed that goes into a lot of people's head when they start a company and they're they're scared of sharing the the, the cake so to speak um and you know they they want it for themselves and they, a lot of people don't trust other people um because there are there are horror stories in business um do you have any horror stories uh in business that you want to share in terms of okay. yeah oh man i got a lot and um and it all goes back to my own issues in terms of my own sinful nature um you know like i just said about we find our identities often in what we do and not who we are my brother and i we we had um really started growing our business in, in 2007 to 2010 we franchised our our first company a real estate company and it grew to about 100 offices in 35 states and so we needed to move our uh, our office and we thought well we don't want to rent we want to we want to buy which makes sense i mean you would too i don't want to pay rent I, i'd rather pay a mortgage well we felt strongly that we needed to wait that we needed to just be patient but in the process we we stumbled upon a piece of land that was in the prime spot that we needed to be in and um and you know what we got ambitious Erlen. And our um, our ambition jumped out of the passenger seat and jumped into the driver's seat, and we moved forward. And we bought that piece of land, and we started to build. Only to discover six months later, the whole real estate market crashed. I could have purchased the property and had it built for half of what I paid. But on top of that, three months after we moved in, we had a forty foot retaining wall that our building was sitting on. It collapsed. Mm. Uh, our problem was we, 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 in order to afford paying for the building and, and the uh, site work, because we had paid so much for the land, we had to go to the lowest bidder for the, for the job <laughs> to actually build the project. Well, we shouldn't have done that. And, um, 
and it fell and it ended up costing me and David over a period of a month. We had to rebuild that retaining wall. It cost us uh, just over a million dollars and we didn't have that money to pay. But by God's grace, our business really kicked it and, and we were able to pay for all of that. And um, But what we discovered through that was that um, we say this when we go speak a lot of places, God's yes isn't always God's go. We had prayed about whether we should get that land, and, and I really believe that it was God's will that we bought the land, but we didn't need to buy it right then. We needed to be patient, that we, we didn't need to let our ambition start leading the way. We needed to let our own, um, that the God actually could have led the way, but we were like, no, you know what? This is exactly where we want to be. I know we should wait, but let's just go ahead and do this. And when we did that, we learned the great lesson that, that you cannot let your ambition jump out front. You've got to you've got to stay the course, <laughs> work your plan, and be patient. And that was a tough lesson, man. I, I still regret it to this day. And that so so how did you guys um, you know two thousand seven two thousand eight this this phase? I mean, it's been a very challenging um, area to be in in, in, in real estate. Um, how did you guys manage to weather the storm? Well, what we what we had to do was build a, a model. Um, specifically in real estate, we had to build a model that would um, weather the storm if a if a bad economy hit, which a bad market hit, which it in fact did. See, when the when the market got really bad in real estate, we had already had years of forging relationships with banking institutions to sell their foreclosed properties. So we weren't just selling houses on the retail market for you know um, people who wanted to buy and sellers who wanted to sell. We were doing that, but we also forged relationships with banks that we would sell their foreclosed properties. So when the market tanked, our business skyrocketed. It actually went crazy. And, uh, and so that's how we were able to weather that storm. And now that the market is coming back, in terms of not nearly as many foreclosures in America, our retail side is doing most of the heavy lifting. So that's that's essentially what we did. The business principle was just build. We we always say prepare for the um, plan for the best, but prepare for the worst. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did with our real estate company. We planned for the best, but we also made preparations just in case the worst happened. And when the worst did happen, we were the ones who were actually cashing the checks. So what you're saying is that you were actually really well positioned for what was going to happen. That's right. Very and well. You, and you you, cat, you capitalized on that. Right. In a big way. That's right. And and you kind of had to see into the future a little bit. You know, that's kind of the beauty of being visionary is that you look into the future and like, okay, well, what if – so here we were in 2003, got into real estate. We're like, what if lending – continues down this path for the next several years where anybody that can fog a mirror can get a loan. What happens if these people can't sell, can't uh, afford their mortgages? You know, so you're, you're kind of thinking down the lines of what happens if the worst thing comes to play and how can I capitalize that um, in business, capitalize on that in business. And, uh, and we were praying a lot. I don't take credit for any of this stuff. I mean, God's the one that opened the doors for us, but we were the ones that had to go through it. So, that's essentially what we did was just focused on that positioning and by God's grace, it worked out great. So you guys are mowing lawns, you start looking at real estate. Um, did you read like Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki? Is that some of the reason why you guys went into real estate or is it all? Honestly, yeah. You know, that's funny you mentioned that book. We, we, we read Rich Dad Poor Dad and a couple of other of those books back when we were playing professional baseball. We're thinking, you know, what are we going to do one day when baseball's over? And so real estate was always something we were interested in. We always wanted to go into it from the investor standpoint. Um, but but once you start out in real estate, you know, you're a young guy with a young family or whatever. We didn't have the money to go and immediately start buying property. So that's why we earned our real estate licenses together and started brokering property. And then our brokerage company took off to a point where we were able to then take the profits of that and start buying properties as an investment group. So it, it just kind of s s 
sprung into existence that way. But R Robert Kiyosaki was definitely uh, somebody that that spurred us on to, to, to have a love for real estate. I think a lot of people read that book and go like, oh, this is simple, but you know, you, you need to be able to have some kind of capital to, uh, to make it happen, to make <laughs> this, that system happen. That's exactly right. And, uh, and, and so that's, that's what we did. So we started the business first, and that became our economic engine through which we could then start purchasing the real estate. So let's, let's move forward in time a little bit um, to the HD, HGTV uh, HGTV stands for home. What does that stand for? HGTV, oh, the Home and Garden Television. Right, and that is really big in the United States. It's huge, yeah. So you guys were you basically had filmed lots and lots of episodes, and then what happened? Well, what happened was um, first from 2007 to 2010 our real estate company exploded and we grew into all those offices from 2010 to 2014 we began to expand into other business uh, ventures and uh, all across the globe kind of the same thing that, that you've done um, and during that time that's when we started getting put on kind of the business radar so to speak Inc magazine and some of those other uh, magazines were taking note and recognizing our business innovation and some of those things. And HGTV w had put some feelers out um, to all these production companies to find some family businesses specific to real estate that they could uh, do a show on. And a production company reached out to us in 2012 and said, hey, we're interested in doing a reality show on you guys and, and, our, and your business and your family. And so to HG's credit, they were looking for family-friendly television. They were looking for something that was, wasn't was just the rock star entrepreneur. They were looking for something that, that had a, a family element to it. And so my brother and I, of course, living on the same street, owning the same businesses, specifically in real estate, our wives homeschool our kids, they, uh, they really liked that. And, uh, and so the production company took a... Um, clip of us in early 2013, um, a video clip, they showed it to these networks. We had five networks that wanted us and TLC made us our first offer. And then of course, HG came in and we settled with them and it was a big offer and uh, they were going to take us straight to TV, six one hour episodes, no pilot. And so we, after a year of negotiating back and forth, signing the contracts, they did their vetting process. During that time when they vetted us, they discovered that we're born again Christians, we love Jesus, we're pro-Bible, we're pro-marriage between a man and a woman, we're pro-life at conception, and all those types of things. And so they, we had several um, meetings with them about our beliefs and things we've said in the past, events that we held for churches and and in terms of leading the church in repentance and all of those things and uh knowing who we were they were still like hey you guys are great you know we, we want to do a show with you guys regardless of what some people may think of you in terms of being narrow-minded right-wing bigoted type people we know that you guys are solid business people you're christians and your family guys and and that's what we want to highlight on hgtv so we began filming and um and this was in let's see what is it it's may 2015 right now right mm -hmm. okay so in april of 2014 last year in april we started filming we had six families we were going to show how to flip six houses the, t the theme of the show was flip it forward and david and i would show families how to find houses fix them up flip them turn them for a profit things that we had done in our own company it was a fun. Uh, it was a fun show concept. We did a lot of fun things. America never will get to see, but uh, <laughs> regardless, we started filming. And during that time, uh, about five weeks in, HGTV uh, made an announcement in New York City at their upfronts where they're trying to get advertising dollars for each of their shows. Um, they made this announcement that the Benham Brothers were going to have a show, and there was a there was a, a group called Glad that was there and they um, they're an activist group and they w started putting some pressure on HG not to give us a show because of what we believe and so uh, HGTV 
went back and forth with us for a week and was telling us about the pressure that Glad was putting on, but that they were going to stick with us and all of that. And um, and then once Glad figured out that uh, HG was going to stick with us, I guess they they they're in with a, another group called Right Wing Watch that wrote a brand new article on me and David, just really demonizing us to the public, and then. Um, implicating HGTV as well, saying HG is going to give a, a platform to some right-wing, bigot, homophobic kind of guys that, you know, that hate women, hate uh, gays, hate Muslims, which are, none of those things are true. I mean, not even in the least. So anyway, it was too much pressure for HGTV. They wanted to stick with us, but they called us with tears in their eyes and said it, the pressure was too much and that they had to, uh, they had to fire us. So we said, okay, no problem. We bless you guys. You made a decision based upon your bottom line. We get that. You're a business. You have the right to make whatever decision that you can to um, to not affect your bottom line in a negative way. And so we basically just over the phone shook hands and blessed them and off we went. So when you rise, somebody rises to popularity, I mean, there's always – you know, you have you have gossip magazines like People and all these other magazines that you know they they take people that are typically adding some kind of value in the world. You know, um, you know, creating either you know uh, movies that people like or maybe it's companies, and then there's an whole industry that's created to to smear um, people's darker side. Uh, yeah. Uh, what can you do in, in, a, in a situation where, you know, when you, you become uh, popular and then there's always going to be people that love you and people that hate you and then, of course, people that don't care as well. But um, how did you guys handle the, the situation? Well, that's why we wrote our book. Our book is entitled Whatever the Cost. So we're Christians, of course, and one of the tenets of our faith is is that if you're not willing to pay the price to follow the Lord, um, that there's a fundamental issue there, that you have to be willing to, to forfeit your reputation, to forfeit, I mean, even your life. You look at these 21 Coptic Christians that had their heads cut off by ISIS. Those guys weren't willing to deny their faith, and it cost them something. But in America, our faith really doesn't cost us anything. And so going into the any type of situation, um, either as a person of faith or someone who's not, you've got to be willing to pay the price to stand up for what you believe in. And if that means that someone is going to think you're hateful when you're really not, you've got to be willing to pay that price to be true to who it is that you are. But if you're not, if you're not willing to pay that price and you're and you're so worried about what people are going to think about you, then the problem comes is that then you begin to get very strategic in the way that you present yourself, in the way that you are. And the next thing you know, years later, you end up realizing that you're nothing but a fake because you weren't true to who you were. So in terms of how to deal with um, getting labeled something that you're not, there's absolutely nothing that you can do if you're being true to who it is that you are. Now you can, you can do everything you can to come across loving and, and to be nice and all those things. And we were all of those. This is why it's so interesting that we were then labeled to be these venomous extremists that you should avoid at all costs. When in reality, that was nothing further from the truth. But uh, for David and I, we never changed who we were, and we still won't change who we are, even though there are plenty of people out there that think something that's totally contrary and false to us. So, um, what what are what is your view on, on other religions and, and and gays and things like that? What what's what's the stand? I believe there? God loves all people. I mean, He created all people, and He loves all people, and we love all people. The the one thing that's very important to note, though, is that God doesn't love all ideas. So that's why, you know, for me in particular, I mean, not even a month or two after we got fired from HG, I had a homosexual couple at my house for dinner. <laughs> you know, and um, we had a great time. 
I wasn't trying to change them. They weren't trying to change me. We were enjoying each other's company because I love people. I love all people. Mm. And um, But all, all ideas, God is not a fan of all ideas. And uh, ideas are what create ideology, and ideology is what spurs you to action. You look at ISIS. You look at some of those guys that are over there killing people in the name of their religion. That's because they have a false ideology. God would not. God doesn't have any desire to kill people, at all. Uh, and and yet here we've got these guys killing in the name of their God. But what about the the Crusades? Isn't it? That's right. That and 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 in the Crusades, one you you had it a long time. It's very interesting with the Crusades that the, that was a reaction to what was going on with the Muslims coming in and actually killing people as well. But specifically for the Crusades, it was wrong. There were things that, that people did in the name of Christianity that was 100% false and wrong, and they shouldn't have done it. And and that's the interesting thing, is that just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you have everything right. God, which through Jesus Christ, came to bring life. And, and Muhammad comes from Allah, and he comes to bring death. And that's not that's not the way it should be. And so uh, a true Christian is someone who is actually going to be a life breather. So regardless of your views, Erland, you could actually come here. We could enjoy ourselves a nice steak dinner. We could talk a lot of business and we can completely disagree on lots of different things. But that's the beauty of America is that not only can you disagree, but you can actually voice that disagreement, at least for now, because we have freedom of speech. But the minute we lose that freedom of speech, then certain things that you would say or I would say, we would no longer be able to say anymore because of that freedom. And, and we truly believe that God is the one who, who leads people to freedom. I have some questions around um, money and uh, Christianity. So um, you and your brother, you're, you're wealthy. Yeah, you're doing well. Uh, of course, wealth is a reflection of the, the oftentimes the, the value you are creating. Um, in the world. So uh, what is your view on, on wealth, money, uh, being a multimillionaire? Um, I believe that um, if, if money were water, that riches would be buckets of water and wealth would be a river of water. Right. So if, if you were to take a bucket of water and, and dip your cup down into that bucket, of course, the level of the water goes down. But if you take your cup and dip it into a river then the water of the the level of water always replenishes itself i think specifically practically uh in terms of business what we need to do is is earn riches which is money you earn once like through let's say you go and do a speaking engagement and make however much money you earn that once through your work but you take that money and you invest it into wealth generating mechanisms through which it will constantly replenish itself now in terms of christianity um, I, my brother and I are not the prosperity gospel guys that say, if you serve the Lord, then you will be rich. I, I think that that's um, a, a perversion of true Christianity because even our Savior Jesus died a poor man. Um, but I do believe that God does allow certain people for some reason um, to earn money, to earn it well, to, to, to make a good living, and to use it to bless people. And so... What we say is that profit is not the surplus at the end of the month. Profit, true profit, is anything that leads to life. So for me to have a business that's profitable in terms of the world, then that means I have a business that's making more money than it's losing. But if, I have, if I'm a, a Christian in business, I can have a, bit, a business that's making more money then it's losing and not have a profitable business because in reality, I'm not bringing life to people in terms of uh, giving them the opportunity to uh, have a relationship with the very God that created them. And that, to my brother and I, is the most important thing. It always has been. What about in, in terms of sales and marketing? Obviously, uh, you know, you need to have a, a good marketing hook to, to generate sales. Um, uh, how do you feel about that? Um, you're probably way smarter at that than I am. <laughs> I've already seen your websites, man. Those are some really solid websites, but let me, let me turn the question. Let me, let me get your answer first on sales and marketing, and then let me give you mine. So what's, what's yours? What, what do you think about it? 
Well, in general, I feel like the uh, sales and marketing world um, are highly, uh, you know, playing on uh, humanity's uh, weaknesses, mm. uh, like sloth and greed and, and uh, etc. Et um, and it works, you know, it works. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm challenged by uh, certain techniques um, that even you know myself i use like my book's called never work again which appeals to laziness right um yeah, but I, I i use that marketing title to get people to read about you know uh freedom about you know getting up every day being excited about what they do and and realizing that life is process and uh, you know unless you can appreciate life's process you'll come to your goal and you'll f figure out oh this isn't it and then you'll set a new goal and then you'll you know you rush off doing that instead of being able to appreciate the love of mastering what you you are uh, dedicated to so that is really what my book is about yeah it's about you know internet businesses and you know leveraging other people and, and stuff like that but the the, the two-thirds of the book is actually about you know uh, if, you, if you if you find what you love and you make money doing it then that is uh, part of being being a free man in 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 that sense that's good and you you picked up on something i think is really good and i think a lot of people need to hear it the, the, uh, this whole consumer mentality that you, God created us in his image and God is a producer. And when we're not producing something, something in us dies. It just dies. Our creative capacity dies. But when we think in terms of just consuming and consuming and consuming, well, that's what these smart, I say smart, that's what these shrewd uh, companies who have their sales and marketing departments catering to people like this. I mean, just, just watch any amount of TV and you'll just see it's, it's constantly trying to get you to buy something, buy something, buy something. And so it's feeding that consumer mentality. And, you know, there was a time in America where we were considered citizens, but now we're considered consumers. So when they talk about the consumer base, it just goes to show you what we have become. We went from citizens to consumers and, uh, and we have a principal in our um, core principles for our company that's to be producers and not consumers that we want to be fountains and not a drain a fountain is always looking for a source you know where you, a fountain has to be plugged into the source and if it's not plugged into the source then it can't give you what it is it needs to give you when you push its button but a drain is always looking for a fountain a dr <laughs> so which person are you going to be you're going to be somebody that's looking to the source of which we'd say is God Almighty, or are you going to be somebody that's constantly looking for the, looking for the a fountain so that you can just you can just live off of them and you can just get 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 instead of give give give. That's interesting. Um, yeah. So God is the creator and 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 He produces things and that's what He also wants us to do. That's right. And if we don't then we're not acting in the capacity that he made us for. So let's say you have a company with lots of people and uh, I mean, a really, really big problem um, in companies is, is people don't feel motivated. I think like 70% of all employees are not happy in their job. Yeah. Um, I mean, part of that, partly uh, because, you know, uh, they can't afford the, the Porsche or whatever, so, yeah. they, you know, they don't feel like, oh, I'm not worth anything because I, I don't have the same car my neighbor has, um, you know, because because we uh, the multi-billion dollar marketing industry is is programming us on, on a consistent That's basis right. to to think, feel and want certain things. And um, one of the things that I really work with my uh, coaching clients on is like realizing, you know, what are your true desires? Um, because, you know, if you think it's money, it's you want the experiences that money you, you can buy. You don't really want money. You don't want like stacks of money to make yeah. a bed out of. Uh, so. Yeah, you're exactly right. That sounds like uh, what's the dude that wrote the four hour work week? Oh, Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss. Yeah, it sounds like something he'd say. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So. Uh, but it's a big challenge. So how do you, um, when you have lots of employees, how do you make them feel like producers? Well, we always tell folks that action precedes motivation. That when I woke up this morning, my eyes opened up. I was not motivated to get out of bed. I did not want to get up at all. And I'm sure you didn't either. 
<laughs> but the minute I pulled those covers back, jumped up, brush my teeth, take a shower, get out of bed. Next thing you know, you know, it's 20 minutes later. I don't want to go back to bed at that point. I'm ready to rock. Mm. That's because I acted first and then my motivation followed. And so we tell folks, you got to lead with action. You look at the person who's fat, you know, and they know that they got to lose weight. Well, they're not going to be motivated to lose weight until they go a couple weeks of hardcore eating well and all that kind of stuff. The next thing you know, they step on the scale and they're 10 pounds lighter. They're feeling better. They got more energy and then they're motivated. Hmm. So it's just, you just have to take that first step. If you take that first step, then that motivation is going to come. And that's how you lead. That's how you lead your heart. Hmm. So just a little bit back to business. You have, um, you guys have 14 companies right now, right? Uh, can you just briefly go through different industries and, and okay we started off in real estate and brokerage and then we got into investment real estate we got into franchising in real estate and then we we jumped into uh, business process outsourcing as you know we we've got three uh, CrossFit gyms and uh, we got two in the Philippines one in Africa and actually a fourth that's about to open in Germany and when I say these, the, the ones that are overseas, we own those with partners. Okay. Um, the ones here local is just my brother and I, and then we've got a, a couple investment partner, partners in some of them. Um, and then we've got uh, automotive marketing. We've got a company in that. Um, got a company in software development, just kind of a small niche there. And then uh, we've got a tax and business consulting company that we own here. And, uh, and finally, our favorite, though, is the same thing that you're doing, Erlen, is, uh, is our own little media group where we go and we speak and we, we're writing books. And um, we don't coach, per se. We don't do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we speak to big groups, and we, we probably like that one the best. It's, it's a blast. Absolutely. It's a, it's a lot of fun. I'm actually doing a boot camp here in London. Oh. Um, in uh, about two weeks' time. So that should be uh, – I'm really looking forward to that. I love the fact that. that you're so proactive and you're doing this stuff. How old are you? Uh, 33. Well, good for you, man. You look young. <laughs> Thank you. Baby face, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're working on a new book. What is that all about? Um, you talk about the book I've already released? No, the, the next one. Oh, the next one. Okay, the next one is a book about our culture that we're in specific to America and what do we do in terms of living faithfully right where we are. Um, so we, we've got some issues going on here in America. Uh, I'm sure you've probably heard, but people nowadays, if they're running a business and you're a, a Jewish business owner, let's say you're a Jewish jeweler and a, um, a, a German comes in and wants you to make them a ring. Well, as a Jewish business owner, of course, you'd, you'd need to make them a ring because you can't discriminate against a German. But if that, that German person then tells you, I want you to make a ring with a swastika on it, you know, represent, representing the Nazi regime. The, or the sun god. Uh, yeah, or yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that Jewish um, jeweler right now in America has the right to say, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not discriminating against you personally, but against that idea that you've got, you know, against that message that I'm not comfortable with. I don't want to do it. Well, that freedom of religion right now is under attack in America uh, in a very, very big way. And, uh, and so now we're writing a book that, that basically will just inspire and hopefully equip people just to stand uh, strong for what you believe and to, and to be faithful right where you are. And do you know when it's coming out? It's coming out um, summer of next year. Cool, cool. Um, and if you want to hear more, uh, then where do we go? If we want to get more information about you guys? Um, our website, BenhamBrothers.com, B-E-N-H-A-M. They can also go to our book title site, which is WhateverTheCost.com. And um, our book is, I, I, I really, I'm, I'm grateful for the way that our book has come out, the Whatever the Cost book, because even though it talks a lot about faith, we talk we, we hit 61 principles through which we built our life on, mm -hmm. our lives on. And, uh, and when you got a book that's, you know, 75,000 words, Erlen, because you wrote a book, you know, you know, the whole word count thing. Uh -huh. 
I know most men are probably not going to read that. So we took those 61 principles and we put it in one of our appendixes. So in 12 pages, you can basically basically get the meat of what I want, especially men, to read in terms of holding on to principle and how to build your life and build your businesses. It's really interesting. Um, why did you guys decide to make cha- videos out of every chapter on your on your website? It's just more engaging. You know, young young millennials seem to like videos better. And uh, and as David and I go speak, a lot of a lot of places are actually playing these videos and then using those as spinoffs to to speak on their own. So we just thought it'd be a good idea. Do you think maybe uh, for the next book there's going to be a documentary that's like attached? Because in 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 a sense, it's like just different media. You got audio. You got like an ebook, you got like a paperback, but then you have the documentary, which is just a different way of communicating a message. So, so you're talking about like actually taking the contents of the book and doing it in a documentary? Well, I was just looking at all your chapters, and if you, I'm sure if you put them all together, that's a documentary. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. See, you can, you're so you... much smarter than us, Erlen, already. Stop flattering me. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I have, I have three companies, three small companies. And uh, you guys are definitely pulling uh, thirty thousand tons um, yeah, more than me. When, so <laughs> when I was thirty-three, I didn't have three companies, a book. I wasn't a speaker, and I didn't have own anything international. So I'm thirty-nine, about to be forty. So you're way ahead of me, man. I need to. I need to get a. Um, I need to maybe join team with my brother. So that uh, <laughs> he's a finance professor. He's always questioning everything I do. He's actually stopped now because I've got some results. Uh, but in the beginning, he was always skeptical of everything I would touch. Now he kind of doesn't always question because I seem to just do stuff. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know. Um, so uh-huh. so the way forward in... in um, yeah, what, one more question. Uh, where do you see the economic cycle to be right now? You guys are in real estate. I mean, 2007, it went down and then uh, it's been going up again. Uh, where in the horizon do you guys see the uh, inevitable crash? I sat, uh, I'll just tell you the short, 2018. Um, I sat in a um, in an economic session with this brilliant Korean man who, uh, he represents a very large organization here, so obviously he's got the credentials and he would be in the know. But he showed us a chart, man, it was crazy. And, and this chart showed the housing market and how how it's um, been up and down since 1908. And you know what? Every 1908, 1918, 1928, 1938, 48, 58, on up into 2008, there's been a major crash in housing in America. Why that is, I have no clue. But all I know is that we had a huge one in 2008. And now here we are seven years later, we've built back up. And now a lot of the same lending practices that were going on in 05, 06, 07 have now started to come back to the forefront in America, like stated income loans, where you don't have to prove how much money you make. You can just tell the mortgage lender how much you make and they'll just accept that. Uh, the the amount of money that you have to put down on a house now is starting to shrink again. So I'm starting to see some of these same lending practices spring up again. So to me, it's obvious we're a few years out, but but since I've already seen the chart that shows every year on the eights, that's why I'm saying 2018. Wow. Okay. So I kind of I'm kind of sensing, and I actually sold all my stocks um, in January this year, oh. um, just because I you know. If when things double and triple, I'm like, okay, that's fine. Then I'm good. Um, so smart man. But I'm not. I'm not buying any more stocks. Like it's all index funds now, and um, right. feel feel pretty good about about that. Have you guys thought about buying or getting the rights for the uh, the reality series you guys uh, made, and then just putting them on Netflix? Well, HGTV is the one that owns it. It was their their show concept. It was their footage, and they just uh, they decided to bury it. So, okay. yeah, that's all right. I mean, we, we never went for reality TV. If it comes back, fine. If not, fine. We're, we're totally fine doing what we're doing, traveling the country and speaking. Fantastic. Jason, this has been a true pleasure. Guys, go to whatevertheCost.com to check out the book or BenhamBrothers.com. Thank you so much. 
Hey, thank you. Listen, man, you are a, you are an expert at what you do. You know, Aristotle says a man is truly wise, not from the answers that he gives, but from the questions that he asks. So you keep doing a good job with that, man. And I wish you the best in your businesses. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Erlen. Take